Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Whitlin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is about how to have a career as a machine learning researcher, focused on ensuring AI systems do exactly what we intend them to do. It builds on and is in part a response to episode three with Dr. Dario Amade, a machine learning researcher at OpenAI. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, I'd recommend doing that first as it explains the broader issue and will make this interview make a whole lot more sense. If you don't have that much interest in machine learning or artificial intelligence in general, you should feel free to skip this episode as our goal was to dive into a bunch of more specific questions. Before we go on, just a quick announcement. Effective Altruism Global is the main conference for people involved in the discipline of doing as much good as possible. The next EAG event is in San Francisco on the second weekend of June, and most of the 80,000 Hours team will be there. The goal of the event is to increase people's knowledge, skills, and network to enable them to have a greater social impact. And if you like this show, you're very likely to enjoy EA Global as well. I've seen quite a lot of people go and benefit a great deal from the people they met and the opportunities they found out about. So you should definitely think about going if you're trying to do a lot of good with your career. The organizers are looking to choose people to come who can get the most out of the event. And so they're more likely to accept your application if you're already fairly familiar with the key ideas of effective altruism and are looking to master more complex questions or get help from other people in the community. If you're fairly new to effective altruism, it's usually best to first join a community-hosted EAGX event. And this year, they're going to be on in Australia, Europe, and the US East Coast. You can apply at eaglobal.org. And if you do so before the 18th of March, which is this Sunday, you can save a bunch of money by getting early bird tickets. Without further ado, I bring you Dr. Jan Leiker. Today, I'm speaking with Jan Leiker. Jan is a research scientist at DeepMind in London and a research associate at the Future of Humanity Institute at the University of Oxford. His research aims to make machine learning robust and beneficial. So he works on questions like, how can we design or learn a good objective function? And how can we make machine learning more robust? Thanks for coming on the podcast, Jan. Hey, Rob. Great to be here. Uh, we'll get to how people can prepare themselves to do work that's uh, similar to yours. But first, uh, you recently started working at DeepMind. What are you helping them with there? So I'm part of the technical AI safety team at DeepMind. So I'm basically looking at questions, technical questions regarding to making AGI safe. Uh, so 80,000 hours is all about getting people working on the most important, uh, neglected and solvable problems in the world. So why do you think what you're working on is uh, one of the most uh, pressing problems that, uh, that humanity faces? AI has the potential to be a powerful technology that we can uh, use to make a lot of positive impact in the world. AI and machine learning in particular have recently been undergoing a period of rapid improvement, and I expect that they will continue to do so. Um, if this is the case, then we can use it to make progress on lots of problems, pressing global problems like global poverty, animal suffering, and others. But with any new technology, there's risks that we should understand beforehand so that we can never get the space and uh, use the technology wisely. And this is what, what AI safety is about. And I'm, I'm working on the technical side of, of these problems. What are some of the problems that we might face in future if, if we don't prepare for them ahead of time? The, the classical kind of scenario that people like to describe is that you're building a very powerful artificial intelligence and you give it some objective function that you uh, kind of is maybe easy to specify that not actually what you care about. Uh, and then uh, this, this AI just ends up optimizing really hard and you get kind of what you specified but not what you wanted. And this is, this is one of the things that my research focuses on. How can we get a good objective function into a machine? So uh, risks from artificial intelligence and AI safety have been spoken about a, a lot in the, in the media recently. Uh, what are some common mis misconceptions that people have about uh, the field? So you're referring to like the Zuckerberg must debate and things like that? Yeah, for, for example. Yeah, I think there's like a lot of unhelpful polarizing going on in, in the pu public debate. And uh, there's like people on the one hand side so saying like we should really focus on these near term issues like self driving cars and unemployment, and on the other side there's people who really care about the far future and like in in Musk's case tend to be very alarmist about it. And I think like just polarizing the space is kind of unhelpful. Um, I think uh, what we really need is like have well reflected, sane, uh, and informed debates about it, especially when we think about building AGI and something really powerful. There's lots of kind of decisions that we have to make as, as a society. How, how do we deal with that? How do we, uh, what kind of implications does that have? And in order to really do that productively, I think we also have to give the public a better understanding of what's really going on in AI. 
What do you call the, the problem within DeepMind? I mean, I, I refer to the issue as AI safety, but is there another term that uh, actual experts ex- experts use? Yeah, there's, there's a bunch of terms that are kind of related that people use. Uh, things like the alignment problem or AI alignment, things like uh, AI strategy and policy. I think like AI safety is, is a term that we are unfortunately stuck with. I don't think it's the greatest term because it has this kind of implicit uh, connotation that somehow artificial intelligence research is unsafe otherwise, which, which is not true. But it's kind of an established term at, the, at this point. What are some of the details of the specific issues that you and your colleagues are researching at DeepMind? We just uh, recently released a paper together with OpenAI called Deep Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences, uh, where essentially uh, we train a neural network to learn a reward function for uh, an agent to maximize. And using using our approach, you can basically learn any, you can teach them the agent any arbitrary objection function that you uh, that you have in mind. So in our case, that was uh, we taught uh, a small robot to do a backflip. Which is really hard to do if you had to have to hand specify a word function uh, if you want to make it look good. Uh, in our case, uh, all you need to do is really look at a bunch of video clips of the agent's behavior and kind of rank them based on uh, how much it looks like a backflip. And this is, as a human, that's kind of like a lot easier to do than say doing a backflip yourself. So, what what's the hope about how this process will will help? So, in the short term, this is just uh, useful to just solve new problems that were kind of difficult to solve before. I'm, I'm here to talking about things like the black f- backflip, but that, that are actually useful. But in the longer term, kind of the, the kind of vision for this project is that um, we're thinking about when we actually do build AGI, what would, what would be the objective function? And the idea here is that this is kind of a small step into the direction of learning, you know, like what humans value or what you would want uh, uh, say a household robot that you buy what you want them to do, and uh, in a way that you know like, you don't need to be an expert in reinforcement learning, uh, but you can just you know, like, uh, give feedback in, in other forms that are like really easy to do for humans. So you just upvote it and downvote it, is or say this is more like what I want or less like what I want than something else. Is it like being at the optometrist when they're testing your eyes? Right. I mean, I think. Ultimately, we want to take feedback in the way that like humans want to give it. And uh, right now, what we do is we have two video clips, and you kind of say like, "Is the left better? Is the right better? Or are they kind of the same?" But uh, I think it would be great if we have better ways of of giving feedback. Maybe you watch a video and you say kind of, "Oh, this part looks really good. This part doesn't look very bad, but uh, kind of looks kind of bad." But overall, you not you don't have strong views about what most of what happens in the video. Uh, I interviewed Dario Amade at OpenAI a few months ago, and, and he mentioned this, the, the black, fi- black flipping noodle and, uh, and how uh, you'd gone about, uh, about training it. Um, so this is a collaboration between DeepMind and OpenAI, right? That's correct. Yeah. Is this one of many projects that you guys work on together? So we uh, just started the collaboration on technical AI safety with them. And uh, we're currently doing more follow-up work that we collaborate on. And uh, my, my hope is that we can find more projects in the future that we can collaborate on. And uh, overall, I, 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 my wish would be to see OpenAI and DeepMind working closer, more closely together. So coming back to this uh, reinforcement learning process with the backflipping noodle, uh, what are some ways that even that training system might still fail and the machine learning algorithm might do things that we didn't intend? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. And this is kind of the kind of thing I'm very interested in because I want to kind of know about all the ways in which things can fail and uh, think of them, think about them ahead of time. In the case of of that project, uh, one thing that we noticed was that if we don't give feedback online, meaning just like uh, interactively while the system is learning, you can run into degenerate solutions where basically the word predictor uh, or the component that kind of learns the word function You stop giving it feedback, and then as the agent continues to learn, the state distribution changes, and then the word predictor has to do well under distributional shift. So it's kind of seeing a new input it hasn't exactly seen before, and then it starts mispredicting the reward. And what we actually saw is that there were some cases where the agent just learns really weird things that you didn't intend, but they kind of look good according to reward predictor because the reward predictor doesn't really know what it's doing in the new mm-hmm. distribution. So if I can try to uh, put that into, into uh, language that, that even I would understand, 
Basically, you have people offering feedback to a machine learning algorithm that is then going to try to predict what humans would say in other cases. Is that right? Yep. And what happens is if humans stop providing information to, to that process and then the kinds of, you know, noodle, noodle movements that it's trying to score uh, move outside the distribution of what it's familiar with and what it has experienced with humans rating, uh, then it will just start giving kind of nonsense answers because it no longer has any basis in kind of, uh, it, it doesn't have relevant human answers to, to draw on. And so uh, you just start getting it, uh, the answers just start breaking down and you'll get like random changes basically in the, in the backflipping style. Yeah, so this is something that um, neural, neural networks are actually really bad at. They, they don't really, they don't have good confidence intervals. They're not good at like specifying their own uncertainty. So when you, when you throw them into like a new problem that isn't what they're trained on, it's not like they, they back off and say, oh, I don't know what to do here. Uh, they just still give very confident answers. Uh, in our case, like you're still uh, assigning rewards to whatever happens and you don't even realize that you shouldn't be doing this. So we described the, the training process for this backflipping noodle on the Dario podcast, but maybe just uh, re refresh our memories. Uh, what, what's, what's the novel insight here? I just I just love the term backflipping noodle. By the way, <laughs> um, yeah. So it, it's a three uh, three part process. So one part is uh, a human looking at video clips and kind of ranking them. The second part is what we call a reward predictor, which basically learns how the human would rank different behavior and uh, turns that into a reward that uh, is assigned to that particular behavior. And the third part is just a regular reinforcement learning algorithm that tries to maximize reward and thus. Uh, basically tries to maximize what the word predictor thinks the human wants. So the concern would be that if we tried using this approach in a real life situation and humans weren't called on to give uh, you know, actual scores of how, how they rate different things that the, that the robot, say, was doing uh, often enough, or if the situation changed such that humans would give different scores, then the, the robot could end up like very confidently doing things that were not at all what we would like because it doesn't just doesn't understand the, the new situation that it's found itself in. Yeah, and th this is exactly the sort of questions that I would love to understand better. Like how much feedback do we exactly need? Can we give less feedback over time? Um, which is kind of what we did in that way, the, the, the work that we're talking about. But if it also depends on how the environment changes and like how can you know when you should ask for more feedback or how can you, uh, what kind of parts of your behavior should you ask uh, for feedback for? Isn't there a way of just getting it to realize that it's now scoring, uh, you know, behaviors that are quite different from what it's seen before? So, so I mean, I, I guess you could insert some kind of anomaly detection mechanism in, into this, right? And anomaly detection is, is a problem class that machine learning uh, has thought about for quite a while. We, we haven't tried doing that. I think um, that might be a good thing to try. Uh, I, I don't, I'm not quite clear on how well anomaly detection like, works right now and how well it scales. So do you see this as a, as a big step forward or is it just, you know, one of many things that we're going to have to try before we figure out uh, how, to, how to really make uh, machine learning, uh, you know, safe uh, in, for, for, for important applications? So I see this as a kind of small step into a direction that wasn't explored very much before. So I think it'll, it'll be very useful once we do like more follow up work and, and like other people start building on this. Uh, I think overall, like there's so many other problems we also want to want to think about and and consider, like uh, how can we explore safely? How can we uh, maximize reward while kind of implicitly regularizing with uh, side effects to encourage your your agent to not cause unnecessary side effects? And what does that even mean? And uh, or more broadly, uh, there's there's lots of other questions that are I think really important that right now very few people are really thinking very hard about. And some of them are becoming more popular. So machine learning security is one of them. So where you have any, like there's this very visceral examples where you take like an image and you just to per perturb it very minimally that you can hardly see or you can't even see it with, with your own eyes. But uh, just regular ConvNet that was trained to classify the image now just change, vastly changes the classification that it gives for the image. And that doesn't only apply to to image classification but more generally if you have a deep neural network and then um, you only need to perturb the input just minimally to change the output in in ways that you wouldn't anticipate 
Do you have to have a copy of the underlying, you know, neural net process to figure out how to create these, you know, uh, images that are slightly different but get classified as a completely different kind? So this is the kind of strike one of the striking things about this that you don't even need that. So instead, what you could do is you could train a neural network from scratch on the same data set, like possibly using a slightly different architecture, and then attack your own neural network that you just trained. Uh, and the kind of input perturbation that you get out of that then also transfers to other models. Uh, and this is what, what, what is called the black box attacks. And the, these black box attacks surpri work surprisingly well. Even if you, say, look at deep reinforcement learning, where people train reinforcement learning agents with deep learning, and then you can even train an agent with an entirely new algorithm or with an entirely different algorithm. So say you train DQN to perform some task, and I'm trying to attack your DQN. Um, so I just train another algorithm, ATC, and attack that, and the uh, input still transfers to your problem setting. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's something that we should really figure out how to fix. It's a bit surprising. It is. It was very surprising to me. <laughs> I saw a paper recently claiming that it would be very difficult to use these kind of distorted image attacks against self-driving cars because they usually only work from you know one particular angle or one particular level of zoom. And because cars are, are moving quite quickly, they get much more of an average of what something looks like from a lot of different uh, positions. Do you know anything about that? So I think there was some recent research that showed that you can you don't have to do much to the stop signs to actually fool a classifier. Hmm. And I mean, given all the other things that I talked about that kind of came previously, it's at this point, it's not so surprising. So the, the bottom line story of machine learning security at the moment is that it's just really easy to attack. Mm. Uh, and there's lots of different ways you could attack. And we, we don't really have very good defense strategies yet. And it's, it's kind of reminiscent of like early days of the internet or something where every, like everyone had all their ports open or something. And it was like easy to, to attack software. And we just like slowly getting better at that. So what are some approaches that you could take to make deep reinforcement learning uh, more robust? I think there's, there's lots of interesting questions to explore in this space because deep reinforcement learning is, is really just about like, general purpose agents in interacting with an environment. And like, there, you can think of lots of different ways, or lots of different qu robustness questions that come up in this context. So for example, safer exploration. How, how can I explore my environment that I initially don't really know much about uh, in a safe way so I don't make like, any ir irreversible decisions or like, uh, nothing bad happens while I do that? Or for example, uh, side effects that I mentioned earlier. Like, how can we make sure that um, when, while you're maximizing your board, you also kind of try not to disturb your environment unnecess unnecessarily not much? There's questions on machine learning security that I mentioned earlier, like where you, like somebody attacks a deep reinforcement learning agent and tries to get it to do certain things, and how can you defend against that? Or, or another thing is that like deep reinforcement learning algorithms are known for being notoriously like uh, unstable and uh, unstable in what way? So, for example, you train your deep RL agent on like ten different random seeds, mm -hmm. and the variance of the performance that you get out of that in the end can be quite large. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would be, I think, it would be good to just uh, make it more stable in the way that you can have more reliable performance. So more frequently converges on the same good level of performance. Right. So uh, instead of just trying to get like the highest level performance for all the random random seeds that you take, I instead you want to have an algorithm that is like where the final outcome doesn't really change that much and it just like reliably performs. So these are all uh, important and interesting questions where we can do cutting edge research. And in a way, I think the working on AI safety is exciting because it's kind of it's not a very well established field yet there's lots of different low hanging fruit that are just really ripe to pick and you know if you're in this field now you could be one of the people who who picks them and it's it's all up for grabs are there any other interesting problems that uh, other people at, at DeepMind are working on that, that you're uh, able to able to talk about i mean there's there's uh, lots of interesting projects going on in DeepMind and one of the perks of working in DeepMind is that you kind of uh, get to see them as they unfold uh, so like last year there was a lot of uh, stuff going on with AlphaGo most of that happened before I was even working there um, but uh, right now uh, a lot of people are really excited about StarCraft 
and uh, we recently released like a uh, research environment for that so that all other people can also uh, work on that and uh, yeah I think there's like there's lots of other really exciting things going on. So what is your work like on a day-to-day uh, basis? Lots of different things. Uh, I, I spend a lot of time just reading archive papers, uh, sit in meetings, talk to other researchers about their research. I get some time to just think, sit down and, and think about problems and like figure out like what, what would be the next good things to work on, like uh, plan that, talk to research engineers and like uh, what they're working on, like uh, on the implementation side, things like that. I guess your colleagues are insanely smart, right? Yeah, this is uh, it's really exciting. DeepMind has uh, really a, uh, a whole bunch of the world experts on various topics uh, around, and and like mm-hmm. you you get to ask them questions. Is that a perk of the job, or is it a bit threatening having you know some of the world's greatest minds around you competing with you? It's it's kind of both. I mean, they're they're not exactly competing with me, mm-hmm. right? But yeah, you're you're all working together. But uh, I suppose it's a uh, yeah, enjoyable to have really smart people to have good conversations with and know know that you're kind of at the, at the best uh, organization at the forefront of the research project. Yeah, yeah definitely. So is DeepMind a, a fun place to work or is it all just, you know, extremely quiet and, and very studious? No, and like, there's... Uh, so we have this really big open office shared space and there's lots of conversations that kind of naturally arise. So at my desk, I have like two uh, like famous professors just sitting right across from me. And, uh, like, you just, like, randomly start interacting with them. And there's, like, people meeting in, like, micro kitchens and cafes. And and we have, like, every Friday there's, like, a party with drinks and pizza and everything. Do you have a lot of other people working with you on these safety topics? Or is it uh, just just a handful? So right now uh, we don't have that many people yet. And I think there's really a great opportunity for someone who wants to uh, build their career to uh, like focus on these kind of things, uh, of th- these kinds of problems. And, like we collaborate with OpenAI, and we we co- collaborate with the hu- Future of Humanity Institute. So there's lots of collaborating going on. But yeah, I really wish there would be more people working on these problems. So, what path in your career did you take to, uh, to end up working at DeepMind? It, it sounds like you're uh, German, right? Yes, that's correct. I did my undergraduate degree in, in Germany, in Freiburg. Uh, I studied math and computer science. I finished a master's in computer science. And then uh, I went to Australia to, to ANU in order to do a PhD in machine learning. Did you work with uh, Marcus Hutter? Uh, I actually did my undergrad degree at, at ANU, so I imagine he was your supervisor. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Uh, did, did you have a good time in Canberra? <laughs> Uh, Canberra is uh, pretty good to make you focus on your productivity, I would would say. (laughs) That's a very polite way of putting it. (laughs) What did you do after after ANU? Did you then go to the Future of Humanity Institute? Yes, that's right. I was was a postdoc there for about six months uh, before I joined DeepMind. So which kind of decisions in your career do you think you you made the right right calls on? Um, I think like... uh, Getting into a machine learning PhD at the time that I did was a very good decision. I, I really liked working with my supervisor, Marcus Hutter, and uh, uh, I think he taught me a lot of things. Mm. Um, the reason for me to go to FHI when I did was that I thought I wanted to focus more on theoretical research mm. because that was kind of the focus of my PhD. So now I changed my mind and I think that, that empirical research is uh, more valuable in this space. Hmm. And then DeepMind is a better place for me to be. What changed your mind about that? A number of things. It seems uh, right now the empirical work is kind of underemployed, uh, explored in this space. And uh, there's just like uh, lots of things to do and it seems like just easier to approach it that way. I think people should do theory uh, and like figure out safety, AI safety problems uh, using theoretical methods. Uh, it just seems harder for me. Uh, to me, it seems harder to do. Did you ever consider doing policy work like your previous colleague at uh, the Future of Humanity Institute, Miles Brundage, or was just technical research clearly a, a better fit for you? I think there's there's lots of really important and interesting questions to be solved in, in policy research. Uh, so things about like regarding autonomous weapons and autonomous hacking and all of this and people should really be thinking about them Uh, I think in my case I have a comparative advantage of working on the technical side of things 
um, because my background is very technical and uh, I don't really know anything about policy and uh, international relations. What was the application process for getting a job at DeepMind like? So in my case, my case is somewhat atypical. Uh, I had interviews with, because they, uh, at the time when I applied, uh, the technical safety team was very small. Uh, so they were just building it up. And I had interviews with uh, all three of the DeepMind founders. And uh, usually also part of the interview process is the DeepMind quiz, where they just ask you lots of different questions about computer science, math, and statistics, and machine learning. Yeah, as I mentioned, a couple of months ago, I spoke with Dario Amade uh, uh, on the podcast. Uh, he's, he's someone you know and you're collaborating with, with at OpenAI. Uh, was there any things that he said that you disagree with or have a different perspective on? Yeah, I, I agree with Dario on almost all of the things. There, there was one thing where I would have answered the question differently. Uh, and this is when, when you asked Dario what, how to figure out whether you're a good fit for research. And uh, I think Darius' answer was that you should just take some recent papers and implement the models and do that very quickly and see see how quickly you can do it and whether it's fun to you and whether you can like replicate the results. And I think I I would have answered that question in a way that puts more emphasis on you know, like other parts of research, like good indicators whether you're a good fit for research are kind of that that research feels fun and easy to you and it just kind of. Uh, happens naturally, so you just end up thinking about uh, research questions during your downtime, uh, the kind of questions that you, you don't know the answer to and maybe nobody knows the answer to, and you tend to get obsessed with kind of puzzles and problems, and, and also that you're good at explaining like your thoughts or like novel thoughts to people who don't, who don't understand them yet, clearly and concisely. So, so in a way, it's like a combination of like having ideas, like reading the literature, uh, executing a project, and, and presenting it to, to other people. I think like in terms of implementing models, so at DeepMind, we have research engineers whose job it is to work with researchers together and like uh, on the implementation side. So they tend to be really, really good at implementing models and like tweaking them and making them work. And that kind of frees researchers time to think about like the more high level and conceptual question. And, and if you're working on theoretical research, then like being really good at implementation is obviously like less important for you. For the second half of the episode, let's move on to the issue of personal career choice and how listeners can potentially make a contribution to solving this problem themselves. So uh, we both think that being an AI safety researcher is one of the highest impact things that people can potentially do, but it's also potentially very, very difficult work. Uh, what's the lower bound of maths ability that would allow someone to make a useful contribution? So that the, I think that depends on what kind of approach you're taking, right? If, you, if you're doing theoretical work, then you should uh, really be like really, really good at math. If you're doing more empirical work, then like you, you, should, do, you should understand the like fundamental math fields like linear algebra analysis statistics and so on uh, so things like what is the central limit theorem what is an eigenvector like solve this integral stuff like that but uh, on the empirical side you usually don't have to be like really good at proving theorems and stuff like that what kind of thinking is most important to be able to engage in the kind of thinking that is uh, really useful uh, is like critical thinking um, so say you're reading a research paper Want to like ask yourself like what is good about this paper? What is what should be done better? Like how could you extend it? And then kind of like be able to point to like the weaknesses of a particular research output. And this is also then useful when you're writing your own research, right? Because you should know where your own research has weaknesses and kind of how how you could where you could do better and how do you extend it so that if you have more time to work on it or like what to focus on. So in a way, like doing research is is kind of like uh, training a, a GAN. So you have to have a good discriminator to kind of figure out like wh whether you what you're doing is good, and then you can train your generator to to generate that stuff. Another type of thinking is like, of course, it involves a lot of analytical thinking, right? You need to have good intuitions about num numbers. You have to like have intuitions about math and algorithm, like what kind of things take, are like how expensive to compute, and like you have to you have to be able to code. As, as a researcher, you're don't necessarily end up coding so much, but you have to be able to do it and understand how, how to do it. Uh, and uh, I think overall, like something that is really important is that you should be comfortable with navigating kind of a, a space that 
you don't really understand very well because research is kind of necessarily uh, on the frontier of human knowledge and kind of things that we understand. So you have to be comfortable with doing the, with the unknown. And this is, this is in, in some ways, this is like in contrast to the skills that an undergraduate degree selects for, where you're really basically learning about things that we understand well, and then it's more you need to be able to remember them and like you need to be able to understand them quickly rather than dealing with the unknown. If someone's already familiar with machine learning, if they if already have some training in it, what kinds of things can people try to see if it's a good fit for them? So, so if you if you already know how to do research in machine learning, then you should have uh, all the skills that you need to do research in AI safety. And really, these are not like two different things. There's not like AI and AI safety. They're both AI questions, or they're both machine learning questions. So you you'll approach them with the same tools. You'll think about them like, like in the same way. It's really uh, the same same problems. And if people don't know much about machine learning, how can they figure out if this is a sensible path for them to to go further down? So there's there's various aspects to this, right? Like there's this question like how excited are you about machine learning? How excited are you on working working on that? Uh, do you want like want to work more on the research side, or do you want to work more on the implementation side, like stuff like research engineering? And like how can you figure out whether you have each of these skills, right? So there, there's a lot of resources online where you can that that help you go through tutorials and and implement uh, various deep learning models. So that's that's one thing where if you want to work on the implementation side, I think if you want to work on the research side, it's uh, usually good to get a PhD or some kind of equivalent experience in order to really skill up on the research skills. Um, so how do you how do you know if you're a good fit for that? Well, you should just work on a research project with uh, some like a supervisor at university or or like in an internship, say, and see how how well that goes and like how much fun you have doing that. Uh, so we'll talk about the PhD in a minute, but what would be the ideal un- undergraduate degree for someone who's thinking about uh, working on AI safety in future? I think the perfect undergraduate degree is kind of computer science and mathematics. Like if you have if your undergraduate degree is in another quantitative subject, like like physics or something, that's that's also fine. Uh, but you really like you should know all the, the fundamentals, like linear algebra, culture, calculus, coding, algorithms, machine learning, deep learning, reinforcement learning, statistics, and so on. Generally, it's like good to prioritize harder courses over easier ones. So, like if you have to say choose between a math course or an applied course, then I would recommend the math course, even if it doesn't seem that related to you to what you actually want to do. I think it's generally a good idea to start doing research early and try to publish uh, at least one paper before you finish your degree, uh, your master's degree, uh, because that would make you, put you in a much better position when you actually apply for PhDs, because that's kind of a proof that you are able to do research uh, and, and people can evaluate how, how good you'll be based on that. It's also good to find uh, a supervisor that is not necessarily the most famous supervisor, because if they're really famous, they usually don't have, end up having much time for you. But somebody who's just really good at supervising, so you can learn a lot from them and get a lot of feedback. And, and that way, you'll also have an easier time to find out whether you're a good fit. Speaking of which, DeepMind doesn't exactly have open offices that anyone can just uh, walk into and, and meet everyone. If someone's, you know, uh, they finished an undergraduate degree and they have an interest in this whole area, is there any way that they can go about meeting people who are working uh, in, in, in the field, potentially at, say, a conference on the topic? Yeah, so um, I would recommend going to like one of the top machine learning conferences. And so, so these are ICML, NIPS, iClear, and so on. And ideally, you would like you can look at the papers that are coming out. You can look at them online, and you can like go through them and find like the papers that you find interesting. And then uh, it makes sense to like read them in detail uh, beforehand. So like when you actually meet these people, uh, you can ask like uh, smart questions about them rather than asking the the questions that everyone asks. So it sounds like you're you're pretty enthusiastic about people doing machine learning PhDs. Are there any alternatives to doing a machine learning PhD that that are worth mentioning? Yeah, so a PhD is usually the requirement for someone to hire you as a researcher. Mm. Um, there's some exceptions for that, and the there's like other routes that give you similar kind of experience. So the Google Brain Residency is one example of that. There's also uh, people who start their PhD and then they kind of uh, stop midway through and go like work in one of the industry labs. For some positions like research engineering, uh, a PhD is not strictly required. Um, you basically have to be really good at coding and understand machine learning and follow the research. 
And the reason why I, I would recommend people to get a machine learning PhD and if they're in a position to do so is that this is kind of where we are currently the most uh, talent constrained. Mm -hmm. So DeepMind and for the technical AI safety team, we'd, we'd really love to hire more people who have like a P machine learning PhD or equivalent experience and, and just uh, get them to work on AI safety. And the problem is that there's like not enough people who have that required background and are also excited about working on AI safety so that we could hire more. To what extent do you think people should go down, you know, traditional machine learning paths and, and work with people like, like you at DeepMind versus try to do AI safety research on, on their own or in, you know, among groups of like-minded people outside of an institution like DeepMind? Yeah. So, so I think this is, this is quite important because I think if like people try to try early on to be independent researchers in AI safety tend uh, not to be very successful with that. Uh, and I think like going through one of these uh, more established paths to uh, getting the, the required research skills is, is a really good idea. And uh, so uh, in a way, like a machine, uh, like a PhD is not actually like the thing we care about, but it's more a package of uh, a number of related skills that are really useful if you want to be a researcher. Do people face any trade-offs in deciding when to switch from the most mainstream machine learning research questions to working on the kind of safety topics that that you're particularly interested in? Yeah, so that could that could happen. That that should happen basically when you have when you feel confident that you have the acquired skills. So that could be for example in, in like the later years of your PhD if you're doing a machine learning PhD or it could be like after you finished your PhD and you, you go somewhere else after that. I think usually I, I see people who overemphasize uh, going into that, uh, into AI safety research as quickly as they can over like skill building or sometimes people are really concerned about like working on capability research where that is you know, like meant to be something that is not safety research. But I think uh, these these concerns are... Uh, overemphasized and then people shouldn't worry too much about them and rather really just focus on like their their career capital uh, where might someone work before they're ready to apply to DeepMind is that a possibility that someone could do a PhD but not yet be ready to to work at DeepMind and are there any intermediate steps that they can take to to, to bridge the gap yeah, uh, I think there's lots of interesting things to do. There's uh, machine learning internships. So I think one of the a good place to to do an internship is the is Mila in Montreal. There's various uh, machine learning startups where you might work. You might do a postdoc in industry. There, I think there's there's a lot of options. If someone skills up in machine learning, but then either can't find a job in AI safety research, or they decide that that's no longer what they want to do. Uh, what other kind of options do they have for you know either having a good life or or doing a lot of good for the world? Yeah, I think right now if you have a PhD in in machine learning, you're like really hot shit, and there's so lots of people who just want to throw money at you to be around them and and like make cool machine learning things happen. Um, so there's like lots of different industry labs that you could join. There's like in particular if you want to use like machine learning in a more applied setting to to do good in the world. There's lots of projects that you could join there, lots of companies. Uh, there's stuff going on at DeepMind for uh, using machine learning for health, for example. But yeah, I think right now, if you have that kind of degree, like you wouldn't have problems to find a really well-paying, comfortable job. Yeah. Thinking a bit outside the, the box for a minute, uh, are there any options in other areas like going into, I don't know, politics or uh, any other ways that uh, people with machine learning experience might be able to help to deal with uh, AI safety issues? Yeah, so there's a lot of questions around AI that come up in like policy government uh, space that uh, I think we really need to deal with and face and like having people these institutions who really understand the technical details of uh, what's going on in machine learning is it's going to be really helpful to have really informed discussions about this. So I, I think this is something that uh, people with a technical background should uh, also really seriously consider because I think there's a lot of great potential for impact there. And uh, I, I know you had Miles Bandage on, on the podcast just uh, a while ago, and uh, he's written this excellent guide on like how to do a, a policy yeah, we'll uh, we'll stick up a link to that in the in the notes on the on the episode, so people can can also find out about yeah the the politics and policy uh, and and then strategy side of AI safety. 
Uh, another approach that people might take is trying to earn to give. So if they have an ability to make quite a lot of money, they, they might go do that and then try to donate it to people or organizations or projects that they think uh, will help to make artificial intelligence more safe. Do you think that that's a sensible approach for people to take? So at the moment, uh, I would say that the talent gap in technical AI safety is just so much larger than the funding gap that I wouldn't really worry about putting more money into this area. It's really like we need people to work to solve these problems. Yeah. Are there any other technical approaches to AI safety other than doing machine learning research? Yeah, there, there are some other approaches, uh, most notably the agenda for highly reliable agent design that came out of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute. And uh, for that kind of work, your background would probably be a PhD in logic or, or something like that. Yeah, my, my impression is that uh, the, the talent gap for machine learning PhDs is much more severe. And I expect that in terms of the number of, of technical AI safety researchers that will be working on this in a few years' time, uh, I think uh, a lot of them will be machine learning. What's the biggest downside of the career path that you've taken? <laughs> I have a lot of work to do. Okay, right. And I guess a lot of responsibility because it's such an important issue that you're working on. Yeah, it's like right now there's all these things that like really need to be done and there's mm. not, not many people to, to do them. So I'm like, uh, I have to prevent myself from like, really doing all of them or mm. like trying to do all of them and then failing miserably because it's really too much to do. Mm. Well, you have a lot of prioritization to do, I guess. Yep. So there's some people who are worried about AI safety and interested in contributing, but they are reluctant to get involved because they think, you know, I'm not one of the smartest mathematicians in the world. I'm not one of the smartest mathematicians in America. So can I, can I really make a difference? Do you think that's, that's misguided? Yeah, I think you really don't need to be a math genius to work on these problems. I think it's really much more important that you have uh, like the research mindset and you can think critically and, and come up with new ideas and um, and I guess stick with difficult problems, even though it's uh, not clear, you know, when you're going to find a solution. Exactly. Yeah. And you, you you'd be comfortable with working with the uncertainty and, and, and unknowable questions. So suppose someone is thinking of doing a PhD in machine learning. Uh, what general advice do you have for them in preparing for that or, or what they should do while they're doing their PhD? So uh, wh while you're figuring out whether or not to do a PhD and where to do it, I think there's like a lot of things that you should factor into your decisions and it's like really helpful to read general advice on how to do a PhD and there's a lot of that you can find online in various books. Uh, right now, pursuing a PhD in machine learning is very difficult um, because uh, a lot of senior people have left for industry. So there's not many professors around uh, in academia anymore who, who train students. And as a result of that, uh, and also because uh, ML is really, really exciting at the moment, there's lots of people trying to move in this space. PhD applications are extremely competitive, especially in the top places. On the other hand, today we have like so many other tools available um, that you can use to get into this, like online courses. There's like a deep learning course on Coursera now. Uh, there's like deep reinforcement learning courses that you can check out online. There's like tutorials and, and open source frameworks like TensorFlow and, and other things. And uh, right, like at the moment, like basically all the machine learning publications are like available in archive. So there's like you can just read them for free. But like all of these things don't really teach you research skills. And I think for, for that, like doing something like a PhD is, is very, very uh, useful. Uh, we're often a little bit reluctant to tell people to go and do PhDs unless they're really sure that uh, they want to work in the area because it can be a really big commitment. Uh, how long does a machine learning PhD take? Yeah, so in the in the US they they can take like five or six years. In the, in the Europe they're they're they tend to be shorter. They can be like three or four years, but they require you to have a master's degree when you apply. Uh, so so in that way it is it is quite a big bigger type commitment. If you decide that you don't want to continue halfway through, can, can you leave with a master's? In the US, you can, uh, I think after two years or something. Uh, there's also cases where people have started a PhD and then got hired by like a top <laughs> industry lab kind of halfway through. So you're probably not going to be uh, short of options. Yeah, I don't think. Uh, if you do well on, on a machine learning PhD, I don't think you will have, be short of options. What if someone did their undergraduate degree in something other than maths or computer science? Uh, how can they pivot to get into a machine learning PhD? Yeah, I think that depends on what your what your background is and where you are in the career. So if you uh, say have a PhD in physics, uh, maybe what you should do is read up in machine learning and then try to do an internship and get a paper published. Um, if you're more on a like 
batch tracer, master's level, maybe a master's in machine learning is the right thing to do for you. Uh, it really depends on like what you are, what you've done, how much research experience do you have it already, and stuff like that. Well, it, it sounds uh, like you could use uh, all of the help that you could get at, at DeepMind and you'd be really interested in, in hiring people who, who are qualified to, to do this kind of research. So is there any last thing you'd like to say to, uh, in, uh, to people to inspire them to, to try to come and join you? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, of course. So I think AI ha- will open up all, all of these amazing opportunities to do good in the world. And uh, in particular, AI safety is especially promising of like high impact stuff that you can do because it's so f- other, few other people are doing it. And we're really trying hard at DeepMind to hire more people to do that. And it's really, it's been quite difficult to do that. So yeah, I would really love if you're, if you're like really good at machine learning, like you should come work with us. My guest today has been Jan Lecker. Thanks for coming on the 80,000 Hours podcast, Jan. Thanks so much for having me. If you enjoyed that episode, remember to consider applying for Effective Altruism Global San Francisco at eaglobal.org. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.